Hello and welcome to episode 25, Remastered. This episode will be the first in a new series on the evolutionary history of life. The first episode of this evolutionary history, naturally, is all about the first life forms, the first replicating cells, and the earliest kinds of communities and food chains that these very primitive life forms developed. To really understand how the first forms of life emerged, we have to understand the environment that this life was born into. We have to understand what minerals in the planet's crust and what gases in the atmosphere our earliest ancestors were exposed to. This long era is called the Precambrian, and it's a massive expanse of time that began with the formation of the Earth 4.5 to 4.6 billion years ago, and it lasted up until the Cambrian explosion about 540 million years ago. Thus, the whole Precambrian eon lasted nearly 4 billion years. Even though this eon constitutes nearly 89% of Earth's lifetime, we know very little about it, biologically speaking. The first half billion years of the Precambrian were hellish, and the world was largely lifeless. For the next billion years, what little life that did exist remained as single cells. Now for the next billion and a half years, these primitive cells would evolve greater sophistication in their organelles and their DNA. They would evolve symbiotic relationships and multicellularity. And near the end of the Precambrian, all of these evolutionary steps that built momentum over the last two billion years would eventually create the first multicellular life, the first plants, the first fungus, and the first animals, or at least their primitive ancestors. None of these early life forms would start producing fossils en masse until the very end of the Precambrian. Fossils of some of the earliest cells were very rare to form, but some have been recovered and studied extensively. Really small fossils, like those of cells, are extremely hard to find, and small multicellular organisms aren't much easier. Furthermore, most multicellular organisms that emerged during the Precambrian were soft-bodied, they had soft tissues, and nothing like bones or exoskeletons, and so they were very unlikely to become fossilized. So with all of this being said, I'm going to continue into the biochemical emergence of life, and some of this might sound very familiar to episode 2, where I introduced the basics of biochemistry and the chemical environment of life on the molecular level. The story of life is a story of all living things, including us. We have all descended through millions of generations, across billions of years, from the first cells that were capable of self-reproduction. Now when I say we, I mean myself, and you, and both of our families, and all of our friends, and all of our friends' families, and their friends, and their families, and the rest of humanity. In addition to all of humanity, I also mean all of the plants and fungi that creep through the topsoil of the earth and reach upwards to find the sun. I also mean the animals and the bacteria and the archaea and everything else that crawls or squirms or flies or swims through the thin, habitable biosphere that clings to the earth's surface. The story of all of this life begins 4.1 billion years ago when the first groupings of biomolecules organized inside the first cellular membranes to maintain a stable, self-reproducing entity. This early time period is called the Hedean, and it began with the fiery birth of our planet Earth nearly 4.6 billion years ago. The Hedean was a time that lasted for six million centuries, filled with earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and the perpetual asteroid impacts that tapered to a gradual end about 4 billion years ago. Now, this isn't to say that there was some hard delineating event 4 billion years ago, it's just that this is the time frame created by geologists that's based on their evidence from their field of study. Now, I'm not a geologist, but I tend to take their word for it. During this Hedean period, lava flows perpetually repaved and resurfaced the Earth. These fields of flowing and cooling lava were propagated by the heavy volcanic activity of the unstable and still developing tectonic plates. Now the surface of the Earth wasn't the only source of chaos. 
The early solar system was characterized by rings of debris, of fields of dust and rock. Earth began as a small mass, which grew by accumulating the matter that happened to be in its orbit. The planet grew, it accumulated mass, and its gravity swelled in size, gulping down all of the matter that it could reach. And in time, the Earth had cleared its orbit, consuming virtually all of the available dust and rock. As the Earth continued to grow, the interior pressure increased until it was a ball of liquid iron with a primitive mantle and the newly formed tectonic plates. These early tectonic plates were very unstable, and they broke often, spilling magma onto the surface, like the blood of the planet seeping out from massive cracks and tears. If you were to stand on the surface of the Earth and look up, this period of dust accumulation and orbit clearing would have been characterized by extremely heavy asteroid bombardments. The sky would have been carved up by streaks of black smoke and fire that smashed into the surface throughout the day and night. It would have been unending, perpetual. Now, to make this extreme image even more intense, the formation of the moon involved a glancing impact of literally planetary proportions. At some point in the Earth's early history, a planetary body known as Thya collided with the Earth. Thya, or Thea, is predicted to have been roughly the size of Mars, so the impact would have been incredible. The force of its impact vaporized a significant amount of the Earth's crust, throwing an immense layer of vaporized rock into the atmosphere and an even greater debris field into space. This debris field contained about 20% of Thea's mass. Some of it would eventually fall back to Earth while some of it would fly off into deeper space, presumably lost forever or to get caught somewhere in a gravitational well of some other planet, like Jupiter or something. But about 50% of this debris field would eventually coalesce at a stable point in orbit around the Earth to form Luna, the moon. Over a couple thousand years, the layer of rock vapor that was thrown into the atmosphere settled back down to the surface, and the heavier material that was on the molten crust sank deeper into the Earth's mantle. The Earth's atmosphere at this point in time is a hellish 446 degrees Fahrenheit. It's choked with carbon dioxide and nitrogen. As for oxygen, it's actually very rare in this early atmosphere, at least in the free-floating gaseous form that composes 21% of the atmosphere today. Hadean volcanoes were commonplace, erupting at up to about a hundred times the rate that they do today. There was so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that the surface pressure was 27 times what it is today. This is the equivalent of being 270 meters below the surface of the ocean, where the pressure is immense and crushing. This carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was slowly absorbed into the newly forming oceans, and it was sucked into the mantle through the actions of plate tectonics. The early oceans themselves were boiling pools, rich with mineral sediment and the chemical building blocks of life. In time, the surface of this hellish world cooled down. The oceans cooled as well, as undersea volcanoes and magma-exposing breaches in the ocean floor shrank, cooled, and solidified. The same thing happened on the drier surface of the planet wherein volcanic activity had largely subsided as the tectonic plates became more or less stabilized. Around 4 billion years ago, the conditions of the Earth had cooled and stabilized by a significant margin, and the Hadean Eon came to an end. The end of the Hadean gave way to the Archaean Eon, which lasted for nearly 1.5 billion years or from about 4 to 2.8 billion years ago. The Archaean Eon saw a significant cooling of the Earth compared to the Hadean. Now make no mistake, the Archaean was much, much hotter than it is today. There was still significant heat left over from the early bombardment, and the tectonic plates were still in the process of cooling. This is a process that takes many millions of years. But what's important is that during the Archaean, the tectonic plates had cooled enough to allow stable continents to form. There's a general lack of minerals that have been recovered and dated to have originated from the Archaean Eon, as the crust is largely believed to have still been relatively tumultuous and susceptible to the occasional resurfacing. 
After Thea was destroyed and the moon formed, both the moon and the earth happened to intercept a massive cloud of debris that was moving through space. This interception is called the late heavy bombardment, as the young moon and the young earth were engulfed in storm after storm of asteroid impacts. These impacts were frequent. Based on the dating of crater clusters, it's believed that the late heavy bombardment impacts lasted for nearly 300 million years, from 3.8 to 4.1 million years ago. The origin of the debris cloud that caused this late heavy bombardment is unknown. It could have been generated by perturbations in the orbital resonance of the outer planets, pushing material into the inner solar system. It could have been formed from a smaller rocky planet, either crumbling from the stresses of gravity or a collision with Mars or something like that. So while we might not understand the origin of the, of the dust cloud that led to the late heavy bombardment, we do have a very good understanding of how this late heavy bombardment affected the Earth. It's believed that this bombardment was so violent that it contributed to a remelting of large portions of the Earth's crust. Imagine being pummeled by asteroids so frequently and for so long that huge regions of the crust eventually just reverted back to magma. During the early Archaean Eon, the Sun was 4 billion years younger. At this point in its youth, the Sun was a lot smaller, with about 75% of its current luminosity and heat. This younger Sun, however, put out significantly more ultraviolet radiation than it does today. It isn't quite understood if this would have helped or hindered the development of life. I mean, on one hand, the UV radiation could activate some biomolecules, and it would encourage mutations in the DNA of the earliest cells, which would promote genetic variety and thus encourage evolution. But on the other hand, depending on the strength of the UV radiation, it could destabilize or outright destroy most biomolecules. Lightning is thought to have been a much more likely trigger of biomolecule synthesis and activation than some of this early, heavy UV radiation. This is because lightning can both provide enough energy to activate all kinds of biomolecules, and it can also chemically react with the atmosphere and with bodies of water in ways that are favorable to form biomolecules in the first place. It's around this time period, around the late Hadean and the early Archaean, that life is believed to have first appeared. These first life forms were single-celled organisms, primitive cells with primitive molecular machinery inside their barren plasma membranes. This process, where non-living matter comes together to form living matter, is called biopoesis, or abiogenesis. In layman's terms, it's the genesis of the first life forms. The exact chemical processes through which organic molecules coalesced into working metabolic systems, all encapsulated within the naturally formed phospholipid membranes, is not perfectly well understood. We have a lot of clues, and there's a lot of competing hypotheses, and there, there's a lot of working explanations for a lot of this stuff, but there's no overarching, complete chemical explanation for how this happened. It's still a mystery, and it's a very intensive part of current biological research. Anyway, however they first came to be, these early cells, which were the first ancestors of all the living things that would follow, they began to multiply. These cells began to clump into aggregates and move with the tides, with the currents of the water around them, eventually getting washed up on the coasts of an island or a continent. In these shallower waters, these microbial organisms, or these single cells, would then accumulate into groups and form colonies. It's also possible, and quite likely, that the first cells formed in hydrothermal vents deep on the floor of the ocean, where the steady flow of heat and sulfur would have provided both the thermal and chemical energy that enabled the formation of these living systems and their perpetuation. The minerals on the internal surface of the hydrothermal vent would have provided an ideal substrate for these early biochemical systems. But some scientists dispute the idea of cells forming in hydrothermal vents, suggesting that UV radiation, or lightning, is a necessary component of early biochemistry. Another theory for the origin of life on Earth is called panspermia. The theory of panspermia argues that the first forms of life on Earth were effectively seeded here from asteroids that came from other planets. 
The idea is that microbial life on some other planet or moon persisted on a clump of rock as it was blasted out of the planet's gravity well in some kind of extreme impact. So the theory of panspermia doesn't actually explain the origin of life itself. It just explains how life might have come to be on the planet Earth. This theory might seem outlandish at first, no pun intended, but there's a lot of really interesting evidence that actually validates the theory. First of all, many biomolecules have been shown to be able to persist for great lengths of time on the surface of asteroids. Second, microorganisms that have been exposed to the vacuum and the radiation of space for prolonged periods of time can awaken from dormancy and reproduce normally if they're returned to comfortable conditions, like a habitable biosphere. It's entirely possible that life forms like single cells could survive the brutal forces and subsequent ejection involved in an asteroid impact. Chunks of rock that are thrown into space after such an impact could be host to these microscopic organisms. And should that ejected rock ever move through space to land on a more habitable planet, these microbes could fall off or crawl off and effectively seed the planet. It's been theorized that life on Earth could have originated from life that was transferred through panspermia from the planet Mars. It's believed that a young Mars was warmer and wetter with a thicker atmosphere, and so it's possible that life could have existed at one point on such a young, habitable Mars. However, Mars's relatively small size caused its core to cool and solidify relatively quickly. This solidification of the core led to the dissolution of the planet's magnetic field, and it exposed the Martian atmosphere to solar wind. Over a few million years, the Martian atmosphere was degraded, it was stripped down and blown away. The surface of Mars was blasted with more and more UV radiation as the density and the thickness of the atmosphere continued to shrink. This window of opportunity, so to speak, wouldn't have allowed any possible life to evolve much beyond colonies of single-celled organisms. Mars simply wasn't hospitable to life for a long enough period of time for anything complex to have evolved. Now, it's difficult to precisely identify the first life form, but we have identified life that existed as early as 3.7 billion years ago in the form of biogenic graphite that we found in Greenland, or 3.5 billion years ago in the fossils of microbial mats that are found in Australia, or stromatolites, which you can find around the world, which are some of the earliest microbial colonies to live on land, beyond the grasp of the ocean. It's believed that these first cells were the ancestors to bacteria. Evolutionary biologists at the Heinrich Hein University in Dusseldorf, Germany, published a study in July 2016 that looked at the genes that were likely to have been present in the LUCA, the LUCA, or the last universal common ancestor of all life. This was done in an attempt to see what the LUCA was like, and maybe to give clues as to what kind of environment it probably lived in. Their research began with the near 6 million known genes in bacteria and archaea that code for proteins. Similar genes in separate but closely related species are likely to be gene relatives. By organizing these 6 million gene sequences into related gene families, the evolutionary biologists did some calculations and were able to narrow down and identify 355 genes that were likely to exist in the LUCA the last universal common ancestor. These genes coded for proteins that suggested a hydrogen-dependent organism that could endure very high temperatures, seemingly perfectly fitted for the environment of the inner surface of a deep-sea hydrothermal vent. These genes also included cofactor proteins that used transition metals and ferrodoxins, as well as proteins for the metabolism of molecular nitrogen and carbon dioxide, all with a dependence on hydrogen. All of these genes suggest an anaerobic organism that lived in a deep-sea hydrothermal vent, where it had ample exposure to molecular hydrogen for energy, carbon dioxide for biomass, and iron for enzymes in the mineral substrate. It should be understood that these 355 genes are not representative of the entire genome of the LUCA. It's entirely possible, and quite likely actually, that the LUCA's genome had many more protein-coding genes. It's also possible that this last universal common ancestor 
is simply one of several ancestors to the bacterial or archaeal lineages. This may have been one of the first life forms, but it isn't necessarily the ancestor of all life forms. There could have been stuff that was earlier than this. In any case, the evidence suggests that this particular 355 gene methanogenic bacteria comes from the bacterial genus Clostridia. Now, around three and a half billion years ago, the first single celled life forms evolved a biochemical pathway that allowed them to harness the energy of the sun, most notably a group called the cyanobacteria. This biochemical pathway is the original photosynthesis, and it revolutionized life on Earth. Not only that, it revolutionized the Earth itself. You see, this is because this photosynthetic process consumes carbon dioxide and produces molecular oxygen. The evolution of photosynthesis is responsible for the current concentration of molecular oxygen in the atmosphere today. The total photosynthetic respiration of all the world's cyanobacteria, lasting for literally billions of years into the modern day, has created all of this free-floating molecular oxygen that we use to breathe. Of course, all land plants are photosynthetic, and so all land plants also produce this molecular oxygen, but the vast, vast bulk of it is produced by these ocean-dwelling cyanobacteria. In the late Archaean, photosynthetic cyanobacteria became increasingly common, growing in several forms in the shallow coastal waters on the edges of dry land. These cyanobacteria would take forms like mats, where layers and layers of individual cells created a working community to share nutrients. To us, to our macroscopic perspective, these microbial mats can appear as the slimes that accumulate on rocks sitting on the edges of a lake or a river. Another form that cyanobacteria can take is called stromatolites. I mentioned these briefly, but I'll get into more detail here. The stromatolite is a limestone deposit that's created, uh, in part, by the sediment accumulated by the sticky, clumping masses of cyanobacteria. As the sediment builds up in the clumpy mass of cyanobacteria, the limestone deposit will grow, because the bacteria will kind of shift this sediment down to the bottom, and so they'll make this floor of limestone beneath them. And as more and more sediment builds up, and more and more sediment is deposited below the cyanobacteria, this stromatolite begins to grow. You get this limestone deposit that's lifting off the ground. It's like a node or a bud coming out of the ground. And on top of it, being raised off the ground as it continues to grow, is the cyanobacteria colony. These deposits are common in shallower water and tide pools. For nearly the entire Archean Eon, for nearly the entire 1.5 billion years, life was limited to this very primitive format. You had single cells, and occasionally these single cells would group together to form colonies or microbial mats. But by and large, that was about it. The most complex thing that existed on Earth at the time was photosynthesis. Now, this proliferation of these photosynthesizing organisms rapidly led to the mass production of molecular oxygen in what would become known as the Great Oxygenation Event. Other names for it are a little more negative, trying to capture the terrible and deadly nature of the oxygen catastrophe, or the oxygen crisis, or even the oxygen holocaust. All of these terrible names come from the fact that the presence of oxygen in the atmosphere was deadly, poisoning, in fact, to the numerous species of anaerobic methanogens that lived on dry land and in the oceans. At first, this free oxygen being pumped into the atmosphere by all of this photosynthesis, all of this free oxygen reacted with numerous oxygen sinks, like decaying biological material, limestone, and iron deposits that are exposed on the surface. All of these oxygen sinks bonded with this free oxygen and trapped it and incorporated it into their structure so that it was no longer in the atmosphere. But photosynthesis kept going, and free oxygen kept getting pumped into the atmosphere. You can find notable evidence for these oxygenated iron deposits in Minnesota and Western Australia, for example. Anyways, when these oxygen sinks became saturated, the molecular oxygen that was still being pumped into the atmosphere began to react with methane, and this created carbon dioxide and water. The concentration of methane in the atmosphere dropped, while the concentration of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor rose. As methane is a powerful greenhouse gas, 
Its rapid depletion led to the first Ice Age, the Huronian Ice Age, which lasted for about 300 million years, ending 2.1 billion years ago. As a side note, it's kind of interesting to see how the early Earth went through these hugely long periods of just brutal climate effects. Like, you had the 300 million years of the heavy bombardment where asteroids came and pummeled the crust to magma, and then now you have this 300 million year ice age where massive ice sheets grew from the poles to cover most of the Earth. The Huronian Ice Age would mark the beginning of the Proterozoic Eon, the eon that would follow the Archaean, which would last for nearly 2 billion years, beginning 2.5 billion years ago and ending 542 million years ago. Near the end of the Archaean, mitochondria evolved. These mitochondria would go on to play a major role in eukaryotic evolution. Now, just like the Archaean and Hadean eons that preceded it, the Proterozoic Eon had heavy tectonic activity. The relative lack of minerals from the Proterozoic suggests heavy recycling of the surface minerals through subduction. Less than half of the planet's crust is believed to have formed during the Archaean Eon, and another less than half-sized mass is believed to have formed during the Proterozoic, while the remaining 20% or so of the crust would solidify in the eons that followed. Life in the Proterozoic evolved in an exponential manner, slowly at first, but accelerating with time. In two billion years' time, the single-celled organisms that emerged in the early Archaean had made numerous evolutionary steps, including two major steps. Only having two major evolutionary adaptations within two billion years doesn't seem like a very good ratio. It doesn't seem like you're going very fast. But these two big evolutionary steps held extreme and profound significance for all life that would follow. It was these two steps that enabled the exponential acceleration of evolutionary complexity among all living things. I'll discuss the two major steps, the two major evolutionary emergences, in just a moment. But for now, I want to talk a little bit about the mutations that emerged in Proterozoic life. Some of the first cells evolved organelles, becoming the first population in the branching genetic lineage that would become the eukaryotes. The eukaryotes are both larger and more complex than prokaryotes, and thus they require significantly more energy. The eukaryotic lineage would go on to establish some of its most fundamental lineages in the Proterozoic. Some of these most fundamental lineages that had emerged earlier but were really coming into their own now and becoming established as their own domain or their own kingdom of life included plants, which emerged around 1.5 billion years ago, and fungi, which emerged about 1.43 billion years ago. The first cells that formed were all asexual. But when cells began to spread through space and their genomes began to diversify, eukaryotic cells evolved the ability to engage in sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction offers a number of benefits over asexual reproduction, as well as a few drawbacks. Asexual reproduction produces nothing but clones. There isn't any genetic variation, except for the rare and subtle mutation that might afflict every tenth or one hundredth or one thousandth daughter cell. If a disease afflicted an asexual population, the lack of genetic diversity would mean that if one individual was susceptible to the disease, every individual is susceptible. Whole populations can be rapidly wiped out by a single pathogen, or really any other evolutionary pressure that the population just doesn't have the genetic diversity to respond to. But when you have sexual reproduction, sexual reproduction introduces a degree of variability in the offspring, creating phenotypic variability that allows individuals within a population to have varying levels of fitness in their habitat. A population of sexually reproducing individuals is thus able to produce the genetic variety necessary to survive a disease or adapt to some other evolutionary pressure. Some of the other groups that emerged during this period include the Mesomycetozoa and the Coanoflagellates. The Mesomycetozoa belong to a taxon called the Opisthoconta, which overlaps with both the animal and fungal kingdoms. The Mesomycetozoa are small multicellular organisms, composed of just a small handful of cells, which act as parasites for fish and other water-dwelling organisms, 
The choanoflagellates are single-celled eukaryotic organisms that are considered to be the closest relatives to animals that aren't actually animals. The choanoflagellates possess a small, spherical, or oblong cell membrane that's about 3 to 10 micrometers in length, and they're equipped with a powerful flagellum that they use to swim through the water. The Proterozoic Eon also saw the diversification of cyanobacteria stromatolites, which was characterized by variations in the concentrations and the various types of sediments that the cyanobacteria accumulated. About 600 million years ago, near the end of the Precambrian, a population of eukaryotic organisms began to branch out and become a lineage that would eventually become the animals. The final 100 million years of the Precambrian Eon were packed with evolutionary change and the emergence of new species. This is that exponential growth I was talking about. There's a lot of stuff going on here. The sponges are perhaps some of the earliest and most simple animals, emerging about 560 million years ago. But others, animals that had nervous systems and muscular tissue that could move around freely, they would emerge sometime later. Some of the first of these animals to evolve were the ancestors to the Nidarians, the modern-day jellyfish and sea anemones. In the last 40 million years before the Cambrian explosion, a group of flat, blob-like animals called Edicarus emerged and thrived. These Edicarus organisms would become the ancestors of the modern-day arthropods and mollusks. Okay, now let's go back a bit and recall the two major evolutionary steps that I mentioned a few minutes ago. The first major evolutionary step would be the emergence of a symbiotic relationship between mitochondria and chloroplasts and their respective eukaryotic hosts. These symbiotic relationships were beneficial to all the parties involved. The eukaryotes that became hosts to mitochondria took advantage of the ATP produced by their oxidative phosphorylation. The eukaryotes that would then go on to host chloroplasts took advantage of the sugars that the chloroplasts could produce through photosynthesis. Both the mitochondria and the chloroplasts received benefits from the abundance of nutrients and the inherent safety of being inside of the much larger eukaryotic cell. The second major evolutionary step would be the development of multicellularity. The earliest known multicellular life comes to us in the form of the Francivillian fossils found in a black shale deposit in Gabon, a small country in southwestern Africa. These fossils depict multicellular organisms with radial symmetry and the form of flat, oblong disks surrounding a lumpy central structure. Some of these multicellular organisms were up to 12 centimeters wide, which is really impressive for creatures that lacked sophisticated vasculature. For comparison, consider lichen. Lichen are symbiotic organisms that don't have vascular structures, and because they don't have vascular structures, they often struggle to grow larger than 4 or 5 centimeters. Some of the other early multicellular organisms were sponges, who would give rise to the lineage of animals, and you also had green and brown algaes, which would give rise to the lineage of land plants, and then you also had the slime molds, and I don't know if it's conclusively proven or not, but I think the slime molds gave rise to the fungus. Or maybe slime molds and fungus share a common ancestor. But either way, you can start to see some of the three big eukaryotic domains emerge at the end of the Precambrian Eon. Both of these evolutionary steps, the emergence of multicellularity and the emergence of this symbiotic relationship with mitochondria and chloroplasts, would set the groundwork for the immense proliferation of multicellular life in the Cambrian explosion, which would mark the end of the Precambrian and the end of this episode. We covered a lot this episode, something on the order of 4 billion years of grindingly slow evolutionary history, which only accelerated in the last 40 to 60 million years. In the next episode on this series on the evolutionary history of life, I'll be discussing the Cambrian explosion and the proliferation and evolution of whole new physiologies. If you liked this episode, then give it a like and share it with a friend. And if you like the content that I'm producing, then subscribe to my channel so you can get new episodes like this every Monday. If you want to be super awesome and support the podcast, you can visit our online store or support us on Patreon by searching Patreon for The Biologic Podcast. Links are also in the description below.
And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>